In the Game of Thrones books, the most famous noble families include the Starks, Lannisters, and Targaryens. But one of the most mysterious families is House Dane. Arthur Dane was one of the greatest knights in Westeros, but he mysteriously died at the birthplace of Jon Snow. Ashara Dane was a beautiful woman rumoured to have loved Ned Stark, but she mysteriously died. Darkstar is an edgy emo who may play a key role in the ending of Thrones, because the Danes have a legendary ancient sword called Dawn. Their history stretches back thousands of years, possibly to a distant empire of magic and prophecy. The Danes live in Dawn on the island of Starfall, because according to legend, the first Dane followed a falling star to the island. There, he found a stone with magical powers, the heart of the fallen star, and from that stone was forged Dawn, a strange and wondrous greatsword. Dawn is incredibly sharp and light, but it's not Valyrian steel, it's pale as milk glass and alive with light. For thousands of years, Dawn has been used by only the most worthy Dane knights, who hold the title Sword of the Morning. Most family swords just pass from father to son, but to wield Dawn, you've actually got to prove yourself, or else the sword lies unused. So the Swords of the Morning are all famous warriors in the history of Westeros, and most famous of all is Arthur Dane. Arthur was in the Kingsguard of King Aerys Targaryen. He was said to be its deadliest warrior, but he was also famous for his chivalry, his sense of duty and honour. When he fought against some outlaws, he first won over the common people, then he slew the villainous Smiling Knight with his legendary sword Dawn. Arthur was also a tourney knight, winning jousts and melees. Everyone who mentions Arthur admires and respects him. Ned Stark calls him the finest knight he ever saw, and Jaime Lannister idolised Arthur. Arthur's the ultimate fantasy of a heroic knight in shining armour, like the real-world legend of King Arthur, who also had a special sword that came from a stone, like Dawn. Dane was probably also inspired by Dane Whitman, a comic book superhero knight with a sword made from a fallen star, like Dawn. Dane Whitman first appeared in Marvel Comics in the 60s, when Game of Thrones author George Martin was a teenager and a big comics fan. In fact, Martin's first ever published writing was a fan letter to Marvel Comics in 63. And now, in perfect serendipity, Jon Snow actor Kit Harington is set to play Dane Whitman in the MCU. So, the point is that Arthur Dane represents two of Martin's early influences, medieval fantasy and superhero comics, stories about heroes. But Arthur Dane is not the hero of Game of Thrones. Arthur dies 15 years before the story even begins. Because Game of Thrones questions and criticises fantasy ideas of good versus evil. The death of Arthur Dane is the death of the simplistic noble hero, and the beginning of a more complex story with more complex heroes. But Game of Thrones doesn't completely reject heroic fantasy, and House Dane is deeply intertwined with the series' big mysteries and with the destiny of Westeros. In the Thrones TV show, it's revealed that Jon Snow's parents are Rhaegar Targaryen and Lyanna Stark. The books haven't confirmed this yet, but it's probably true in the books too. Still, the events surrounding Jon's birth are mysterious, and House Dane was involved from the start. So, 16 years ago, Lyanna and Rhaegar ran off together to the Tower of Joy, guarded by three Kingsguard, including Rhaegar's friend, Arthur Dane. Robert Baratheon started a war against the Targaryens, Rhaegar went off to fight him and got hammered, and Robert became king. Ned Stark found the Tower of Joy, killed Arthur and the Kingsguard, and his sister Lyanna died giving birth to Jon Snow. Then Ned took Arthur's sword Dawn back to Starfall, and to Arthur's sister Ashara, a beautiful young woman with haunting violet eyes. We know very little about Ashara, but some characters remember her from the infamous tournament at Harrenhal. This was the biggest party in Westeros. Everyone was there, and everyone wanted to hook up with Ashara. She danced with Oberyn Martell and John Connington, and she danced with a young Ned Stark, after Ned's brother Brandon asked Ashara for him, because Ned was shy. And there are rumours that Ashara and Ned fell in love that night, that they shared words or kisses, maybe more. In fact, some say that Ashara is Jon Snow's mother, 
which is probably not true, but someone did get Ashara pregnant, because according to Barristan Selmy, Ashara gave birth to a stillborn daughter, and soon after, she committed suicide. After Ned Stark came to Starfall, Ashara threw herself into the sea, because her heart was broken. Barristan thinks she may have killed herself because of the man who had dishonoured her at Harrenhal, and he implies that this man was a Stark. So, it sounds like Ned Stark got Ashara pregnant, but then he married Catelyn instead, and he killed Ashara's brother, and that broke Ashara's heart. But is Honourable Ned Stark really the kind of person to knock someone up then dump her? Surely Ned would feel guilty if Ashara had killed herself over him, but Ned never thinks about Ashara once in his chapters. Barristan loved Ashara, so if Ned had dishonoured her, surely Barry would dislike Ned, but he doesn't. It doesn't make sense, so some fans believe that the Stark who hooked up with Ashara was actually Ned's brother Brandon. Unlike Ned, Brandon had a reputation as a fuckboy, and he was never shy about taking what he wanted. He was older, more handsome, more confident, and more impulsive than Ned, so he might have been the Stark who got with Ashara. The year after Harrenhal, Brandon was killed by King Aerys, so grief for Brandon might have been part of what broke Ashara's heart. But whoever her lover was, Ashara also lost a stillborn child, and her brother Arthur died, and her companion at court, Princess Elia, was brutally murdered in Robert's Rebellion. All this horror and loss, and Ashara was probably just a teenager at the time, so it's easy to see how she'd be overwhelmed with grief. But the books never show us Ashara's perspective, we don't know her thoughts and feelings. We only see her through the memories of others, where she's idealised and romanticised. She's a symbol of a nostalgic past, when Barry and Ned and their friends were still young and full of hope. Arthur Dane's the same. When Jamie remembers Arthur, he thinks the world was simpler in those days, and men as well as swords were made of finer steel. Of course, the good old days weren't that good under Mad King Ares, but in memory, Arthur and Ashara represent a mythical bygone time, when knights were honourable and women were beautiful and there weren't so many fucking white walkers. They represent the stories that George Martin loved growing up, of heroic warriors and beautiful maidens. But the Dane sigil is a falling star, and when Arthur falls, and Ashara literally falls, that romantic past falls too. It's a tragic loss of innocence, leaving a darker, more complex reality. But there are hints that even Arthur and Ashara were more complicated than they seem. In Book 3, Arya Stark meets Ned Dane, the 12-year-old nephew of Arthur and Ashara. His proper name is Edric, but everyone calls him Ned, which is weird, because Ned is the name of the man who killed Edric's uncle, and supposedly caused the suicide of Edric's aunt. Edric mentions that he saw Ned Stark once, and Edric doesn't show any dislike for the man who supposedly brought death and grief to his family. Shouldn't Edric hate Ned? And Ned Stark doesn't dislike the Danes, he thinks Arthur was a fine knight, and he brought Dawn back to Starfall as a sign of respect. After everything that happened, why are Ned Stark and the Danes so cool with each other? Edric mentions a woman named Wyla, who works at Starfall. Wyla was Edric's wet nurse, she breastfed him as a baby. And Edric says that Wyla also nursed Jon Snow, so Edric calls Jon his milk brother. So this means that after Ned Stark killed Arthur and Ashara died, the other Danes just let Ned hang out at Starfall while Wyla nursed Jon? That seems really friendly to the man who just got two Danes killed. Also, Edric Dane and Robert Baratheon both think that Wyla is Jon's mother, which is probably a cover story to protect Jon. It's all very confusing, but the fact that Wyla was Jon's wet nurse, and Ned Dane's name, and his attitude to Ned Stark, all seem to suggest that Ned Stark and the Danes actually cooperated in some way. Starfall is fairly close to the Tower of Joy, so it's possible that Wyla was at the tower serving Lyanna while she was pregnant. Lyanna was a teenager, about to give birth in the mountains, she'd need help. So maybe Arthur Dane suggested that they get Wyla from his family at Starfall. It's possible that Rhaegar and Lyanna got married at Starfall, the TV show says they were secretly married in Dawn, 
and maybe Ned Stark found out where the Tower of Joy was from Ashara. There are all sorts of possibilities for secrets and drama between Rhaegar, Lyanna, Ned, and the Danes. There are even theories that Ashara Dane isn't really dead. We are told that Ashara's body was never found, so some fans believe that Ashara faked her own death and helped Ned cover up Jon's birth, and is now living in the Neck with Howland Reed, the other survivor of the Tower of Joy. Others believe that Ashara is secretly Quaith or Scepter Lamor, which doesn't seem very likely because Ashara has haunting violet eyes and Quaith and Lamor don't. But the whole situation is so mysterious and ambiguous that there must be some kind of secret amidst the tragedy. Arthur Dane is also mysterious. Like, he was a Kingsguard, so what was he doing at the Tower of Joy instead of guarding his king from Robert's Rebellion? Why did he fight Ned Stark? Is Arthur really the noble knight we think he is? Arthur was on the Kingsguard for Aerys Targaryen, the cruel and terrible Mad King. Alongside Jaime, Arthur must have stood and watched while Aerys burned innocent people alive. Was the heroic Arthur Dane loyal to this tyrant? In the years before Robert's Rebellion, Aerys's court was divided, into people who supported the Mad King and people who preferred his son Prince Rhaegar. It's hinted that Rhaegar planned to overthrow his mad father and make himself king, and the world book says that in this political conflict, Rhaegar's most formidable ally was Arthur Dane. Because Arthur was Prince Rhaegar's oldest friend, Rhaegar trusted him with his secrets, and Rhaegar had big secrets. Because Rhaegar was obsessed with the prophecy of Azor Ahai, a hero prophesied to be reborn and save the world. Rhaegar believed that his son would be Azor Ahai, along with two siblings, but Rhaegar's wife Elia couldn't have any more children, so it seems that part of why Rhaegar ran off with Lyanna and had baby Jon Snow was to fulfil the Azor Ahai prophecy. And as Rhaegar's oldest trusted friend, Arthur probably knew all this. He was with Rhaegar and Lyanna when they went to the tower, and apparently stayed with them for like a year. When Robert started his war, and Rhaegar went to fight him, Arthur and the Kingsguard didn't go and guard their king, they stayed with Lyanna and her unborn son, presumably under Rhaegar's orders. Because Arthur was loyal to Rhaegar's prophetic mission, and loyal to Rhaegar's son, the future heir to the Targaryen dynasty, and possibly the future saviour of the world. But when Rhaegar died, and Robert beat the Targaryens, the Kingsguard were in an awkward situation. They were stuck in a tower in Dawn, and Lyanna was pregnant with Rhaegar's heir, but they had no allies left. Their side had lost, so now what? In Book 1, Ned Stark dreams of the Tower of Joy. He tells the Kingsguard he thought they'd surrender, but Arthur Dane says, our knees do not bend. Ned says the Kingsguard could run away like Viserys and Daenerys, but the Kingsguard say, they do not flee. Arthur and the Kingsguard stayed loyal and defiant to the end. They refused to compromise and chose to die honourably, following Rhaegar's last order to guard Lyanna. Of course, Lyanna at the time was dying in childbirth and screaming for her brother Ned. All Ned wanted was to protect Lyanna and her baby, and the Kingsguard wanted the same, so you'd think that Ned and the Kingsguard could have come to some agreement. Some fans speculate that Arthur faked his own death and is still alive somewhere, but there's no solid evidence. Everything we know about Arthur shows he's a man of absolute loyalty and duty. All knights must bleed, he said. Blood is the seal of our devotion. So, Arthur bled. His noble, inflexible honour led to his death. The noble knight failed his Prince Rhaegar and his King Aerys. But Arthur's death still has meaning. Part of the prophecy of Azor Ahai is that he'll be reborn beneath a bleeding star. Arthur's sigil is a star, and he bleeds as John is born. The TV show highlights this, putting the star-forged sword Dawn against the bloody bed where John is born. The magic of Azor Ahai is all about sacrifice, and as Arthur Dane sacrifices his life, Jon Snow is born, a new heroic warrior to bring the dawn. In the TV show, the White Walkers are defeated by Arya pulling a sneaky on the Night King. But in the books, there's foreshadowing and prophecy that hint at a different ending. According to legend, thousands of years ago was the first long night, 
when the White Walkers came for the first time. It was ended by the hero Azor Ahai with a sword called Lightbringer. Now Azor Ahai is prophesied to be reborn, and to wield Lightbringer once more. Melisandre thinks that Stannis is Azor Ahai, so she gives him a fiery sword and calls it Lightbringer. But Stannis' sword isn't the real thing. Aemon says it's wrong and false. Where is the real original Lightbringer from thousands of years ago? Some fans believe that Lightbringer is the Dane sword Dawn. Dawn is unique and mystical and incredibly ancient. It's the only sword in Game of Thrones said to be thousands of years old, and could date back to the Long Night. And it's called Dawn. The Long Night ended in the war for the Dawn, thanks to Lightbringer. It's about light overcoming darkness, and Dawn is forged from a fallen star. It's alive with light. So the symbolism and the timeline both make sense for Dawn to be the original Lightbringer. But Lightbringer is said to be a burning sword, and Dawn isn't fiery. So maybe Dawn will become fiery after a sacrifice, like how Beric's sword takes fire from his blood. It's said that Lightbringer was forged with the sacrifice of Azor Ahai's wife, Nissa Nissa. He stabbed her with Lightbringer, and her soul and her strength went into the steel. So maybe Jon Snow will sacrifice his love Daenerys using Dawn, and her fiery soul will go into the sword and reignite it to become Lightbringer. That way, instead of Daenerys' death being like putting down a rabid fascist dog, her death could be a tragic sacrifice to bring light against the darkness. Dawn might be the sword that will save the world. But currently, Dawn is in Starfall, waiting for a knight of House Dane to become Sword of the Morning. Jon's not a Dane knight, so he can't go take it. Who will bring Dawn into the story? When Arya meets Edric Dane in Book 3, he's 12 years old, serving Beric Dondarrion as a squire. Edric is a shy, polite kid, and he doesn't seem like much of a warrior. But when George Martin introduced Edric, he might have been planning for him to become Sword of the Morning. Because at the time, Martin's plan was for Book 4 to begin five years after the end of Book 3, meaning the characters in Book 4 would all be five years older. Bran would have spent five years learning magic with Bloodraven, and Arya would have spent five years in Bravos. Because lots of characters are really young in the books, and the five-year gap would have aged them up, made them older and more experienced for the final books. But Martin found that the gap didn't work for some storylines, and it sucked to use flashbacks to explain the last five years. So he scrapped the gap and wrote Book 4 to just continue where Book 3 left off. So some characters are still really young. In Book 4, Arya's just 11 years old when she starts assassinating people, and Rickon is just 4, so he can barely be in the story. Removing the five-year gap forced Martin to change his plans, and this might have affected young Edric Dane. If he spent five years with Beric's men in the Riverlands, he could have grown up into a 17-year-old warrior, worthy of wielding Dawn. But since Martin removed the gap, Edric stayed 12, and doesn't even appear after Book 3. But in Book 4, a new Dane character is introduced, a warrior with the skill and age to potentially wield Dawn. This character is not as friendly as Edric, though. His name is Gerald Dane, but men call him Darkstar, and he is of the night. Darkstar is a tryhard emo edgelord who wants everyone to know how dark and brooding he is. He's arrogant and violent and cruel. He cuts off Marcella's ear during Ariane's plot. It's a whole thing. But by Book 5, Darkstar goes to High Hermitage, a castle right by Starfall, where Dawn is. Fans speculate that he might steal his family's sword. Because Darkstar is jealous of his famous cousin Arthur. He says the only reason Arthur was a great knight is because he had the great sword, Dawn. It sounds like Darkstar wants Dawn for himself, to prove himself better than Arthur. Perhaps a sword of the evening, to rival the sword of the morning. If Darkstar gets Dawn, he could take over whatever plotline was meant for Edric before the five-year gap was scrapped. Once Dawn is back in the story, it could then find its way into the hands of Jon Snow, or whoever else plays the role of Azor Ahai. Because the connections between House Dane and the legends of Azor Ahai go way back into ancient history and to a far distant empire. When Arya meets Edric, she is surprised by his appearance, because the Danes are from Dawn, and Arya thinks Dornishmen have dark hair and dark eyes. 
but Edric has pale blonde hair and blue eyes that look almost purple. Darkstar has silver blonde hair and purple eyes, and Ashara Dane famously has haunting purple eyes. Arthur's appearance isn't described, but all of the known Danes have eyes described as purple, and most have pale blonde hair. Purple eyes and blonde hair are associated with the Targaryens. The TV show doesn't do the purple eyes, but in the books, Daenerys and her family famously have purple eyes and blonde hair, because the Targaryens descend from Valyria, the ancient empire of the Dragon Lords. Purple eyes and blonde hair indicate the blood of the dragon, the Valyrian lineage of dragon riding and fire magic. Every character in Game of Thrones with purple eyes is either a Targaryen or has some Valyrian blood, except for the Danes. Because the Danes were in Westeros thousands of years before the Valyrians ever arrived. So where do the Danes get their special purple eyes? There's another weird anachronism nearby to Starfall. In the city of Old Town is the High Tower, the tallest tower in Westeros. The High Tower was built on top of a much older fortress made of fused black stone. Fused black stone is made with dragon fire, so you'd think that this structure was built by Valyrian dragon riders, but maesters say that the architecture is distinctly un-Valyrian, so it must have been built by some other people who came to Westeros with dragons thousands of years before the Valyrians. So who were these mysterious ancient dragon riders? Could they be the purple-eyed ancestors of both the Danes and the Valyrians? According to legend, in the far, far east was the great empire of the Dawn. Thousands of years before Valyria and Westeros, it was the most advanced and prosperous empire in the world, until the reign of the Bloodstone Emperor. He worshipped a black stone that had fallen from the sky, which sounds like the Dane legend of the fallen star. And the Bloodstone Emperor killed his sister, the Amethyst Empress. Amethysts are purple, like Dane eyes. And apparently, this caused the Long Night, which was ended by Azor High with Lightbringer. To defend the Empire, the massive five forts were built, which seems a lot like the Wall. So, this legend sounds just like the story of the Long Night in Westeros, except the Great Empire of the Dawn is on the opposite side of the world to Westeros. How did Azor Ahai defeat the darkness in Essos and in distant Westeros? The answer might be dragons. Because the five forts, like the mysterious High Tower Fortress, are made of fused black stone. So the Great Empire must have had dragons. Maybe after Azor Ahai defeated the darkness in the east, he flew over to Westeros and ended the long night there. He could have built the mysterious High Tower Fortress. And he could have founded House Dane, and renamed his sword Lightbringer to Dawn, and started the tradition of the Swords of the Morning to keep his descendants ready for the next long night. It might be that House Dane is the ancient lineage of Azor Ahai, the hero destined to be reborn and to save the world from darkness. And the thing is, both Jon Snow and Daenerys have a Dane ancestor, Diana Dane. Daenerys hatches her dragons beneath a bleeding star, like the Dane Sigil. She has a dream of ghostly kings with swords of pale fire and amethyst eyes, which might symbolise the Great Empire of the Dawn. And the whole story of Jon's mysterious birth is intertwined with the fall of Arthur and Ashara Dane. In Book 3, Jon looks up at a constellation called the Sword of the Morning, and the bright white star in its hilt blazes like a diamond in the dawn, and he allows himself to hope. The fall of Arthur and Ashara Dane wasn't for nothing, and the fantasy ideals that they represent aren't dead yet because they led to the rise of new heroes who carry on their ancient legacy to fulfil prophecy and bring light. After the night comes dawn to defeat the darkness once more. If you want to know more about the mysteries of Game of Thrones, you've got to check out the books. As well as the main series, there's the World Book and Fire and Blood and the Duncan Egg stories. And you can get any one of these on audiobook for free right now by signing up for a trial with Audible. Members get an audiobook each month, and if you cancel, you keep the audiobooks. You can listen in the car or the gym, or while you gaze at the stars and feel hope. Sign up at audible.com ASX.
Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe and comment your favorite edgy Gerald Dane quote. Check out the artists, check out the fandom, and thank you to the patrons, including Ken Macabalitao, Bridget Francis Riley, Christina DeMitchell, Iha Mahaniok, Marty Crawley, and Semmel. Cheers.